Hello and welcome to the Vine Life Podcast. I'm Tony Clark, your host. Now, today I've got the honor of having Dr. Leslie Wickman on the program. And so we're going to discuss her book, God of the Big Bang, How Modern Science Affirms the Creator. Now, Leslie is an internationally respected research scientist, engineer consultant, author, and inspirational speaker. For more than a decade, Leslie was an engineer for Lockheed Martin Missiles in Space, where she worked on NASA's Hubble Space Telescope and International Space Station programs, receiving commendations from NASA for her contributions and being designated as Lockheed's corporate astronaut. Leslie also holds a master's degree in aeronautical and astronautical engineering and a doctoral degree in human factors and biomechanics. Both of those are from Stanford University. So I, I'm thankful, Leslie, I was able to get the, get through that when pronouncing all of those terms. But welcome, Leslie. Thank you. It's good to be with you, Tony. Well, it's an honor to have you on the program. And so let's open up, Leslie, if it's okay with you. You you came out with a book a number of years ago that's called God of the Big Bang. Um, what did you want to accomplish by writing this book? Well, you know, it was kind of an interesting opportunity that led up to it. Um, I was teaching astronomy at the time at Azusa Pacific University, and there were there was breaking news uh, in the astronomy world about possible evidence for Einstein's gravity waves that he'd predicted way back when. And um, I was asked by the university to talk to some different media outlets about, you know, kind of uh, implications for Christian worldview of this possible news. Uh, and um, so I talked to a bunch of different outlets and, and it led ultimately to writing uh, an op-ed article for CNN's uh, BeliefNet website. And so they, they contacted me and said, can you write this within the next 24 hours? And so I, w I sat down after I was done teaching that night around 8 p.m. and kind of scribbled something out. And I mean, it was, it was not just off the top of my head because it was something that I'd been thinking about and talking about in my astronomy class and whatnot. So I had some thoughts about it ahead of time. Um, but anyway, so I, I sent it in to the CNN editor and they liked it and they titled it very provocatively in a way that I personally was not super comfortable with. Uh, they titled it, Does Big Bang Breakthrough Offer Proof of God? And mm -hmm. I'm very careful, both as a scientist and a Christian, with that word proof, because it comes with a lot of baggage. I mean, when people hear the word proof, they typically think of an open and shut case, you know, that there's there's no disputing, right? And and both on the side of science, which is an inductive process and really looks for the best explanation given the body of evidence that we currently have. And faith on the other side, where, you know, free will is so important. And, you know, an open and shut case or, you know, uh, proof, so to speak, of God uh, really would do away with a great deal of free will, I believe, um, where people kind of have the um, the ability to make up their own minds about, you know, whether there's a sufficient case and whether then to take that next step of belief in God and trusting in God. So I all that to say, like I said, I was really uncomfortable with the title, but um, it certainly drew a lot of attention and the, the piece went viral uh, and had over half a million views in less than a week, um, 70,000 plus shares on Facebook. It was wow. in the top five worldwide most shared news, story, news stories on social media when it came out. And it just, I mean, it was surreal to me because, you know, this is kind of stuff that I talk about on a regular basis. And so that, you know, all that attention, um, you know, kind of just blew up, right? And, and in the wake of all that, I was approached by this Christian book publisher, and they said, can you write a book about this in the next four months? And so um, I kind of put a few things on hold and, you know, because book contracts don't often just fall in your lap. And so it seemed like a, a divine opportunity. So you know, I'd have been thinking about it anyway, just in terms of kind of um, summarizing the scientific evidence um, for the God of the Bible. 
Yeah, and 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 I'm curious, uh, the, and we'll get into the Big Bang Theory in, in just a moment. But what was the reception? I, I the, you got a great reception from this book, um, but specifically from the evangelical community. Was there any pushback that you received because you you as a uh, as a scientist and also as a follower of Christ, you believe that the the Big Bang Theory is what God used to create the cosmos? Was there any pushback? Right. Um, yeah, you know, and and again, I've been in kind of this science and faith space for a good number of years by now. And, um, you know, what you see is almost like with any spectrum on any topic, you have um, extreme positions, right? And so you've got people on the kind of extreme end of, of the spectrum in this science and faith conversation, Um on one hand, that would say uh, anything other than a very literal uh, translation of Scripture um, is doing Scripture a disservice, right? And then on the other extreme, you'd have um, uh, atheistic naturalists who would say that, you know, there's no need for God to explain um, how our universe and our, our world got formed, um, and, but those are the extremists, you know, and and really, when you look at their positions, they are not well founded um, and they're really emotionally held positions that, um, again, it's it's not about a rational argument. Um, and so, yeah, I had pushback from both extremes. I had I had people that I mean, I literally had people emailing me um, things like, you know, uh, do you believe the photos that are taken from, you know, the space shuttle that show the curvature of the earth? <laughs> it was kind of baiting me. And I was like, well, yeah, I do. <laughs> and then come back and then, oh, no, no, the, the earth is flat. Those are all just doctored photos and whatnot. And as somebody in the aerospace arena who is trained to be an astronaut and has interacts with astronauts all the time and has, you know, been a part of the team developing the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, it's like, well, you know, I, I don't even know where to start with a conversation where somebody tells me that the earth is flat, you know. So, and then on the other hand, I had, you know, uh, atheist fundamentalists that were also kind of, um, you know, trying to get me to shut up. In fact, I mean, I remember one email in particular where they said, it was there was there was no rational content to it. It was all purely emotional. It was just like shut up, don't ever post on this topic again, you know. And and so you know you kind of have to just decide. You have to pick your battles, right? And and quite honestly, I mean, when it's an emotional commitment to a position that is not well founded from a rational, let alone scientific standpoint, um, you know, it's hard to even know where to to begin a conversation. Well, our conversation would go on forever if I asked you to uh, debunk the flat earth theory. So we won't we won't go there. Thank, <laughs> thank the Lord. Uh, but um, I'm just curious, Leslie, what convinced you? Uh, why do you feel so strongly that um, the, the creator of the cosmos used the Big Bang to create the cosmos? What is there any is there a point in your past that you said a light went on for you and said, by by being a scientist, by studying, uh, looking through telescopes and so forth, that you came to that conclusion? Well, you know, I think it was a bit of a process for me just in terms of kind of coming to terms with what I'd heard all of my growing up years uh, about this kind of perceived dichotomy between science and faith. Because as, as a kid, um, you know, my whole family was involved, very involved in our church and went to Sunday school every week. And um, yet I encountered my first um, atheist teacher in junior high. And um, he, I mean, he would go so far as to say, you know, you might as well just leave your faith at the door because what we're going to talk about in, wow. in biology class will almost certainly contradict what you've heard at church and Sunday school. And um, so that, kind of was the first kind of really shocking thing that I'd heard relative to the science and faith uh, conversation. And it was a, it was an uncomfortable time, you know, here I am, what, you know, 12 years old or something and, and trying to figure out what to do, what to do with that statement. And, um, 
but I look back on it and I'm actually quite grateful that I encountered it at that age because it really kind of set me on the path to figure this out for myself from a fairly early age. And so I was, you know, reading everything I could, um, you know, having conversations with people that were also interested on the, in this topic. And, and so over time, you know, I, and, and even as a kid, when junior high school, I was like, well, that just doesn't make sense to me. You know, if, if God is who he claims to be in scripture as the creator of everything, then how could what we learn through studying his creation possibly contradict that? It just didn't make sense. So, so like I said, I was on a mission to try to figure this out, you know, and, and so over time, um, I started to see the connections and the compatibility as opposed to the disconnect. And so actually one of the things that was really helpful for me was um, starting to read some of the Reasons to Believe material, um, uh, especially from Hugh Ross, uh, and, and coming to understand really that a faithful interpretation of scripture is more than just kind of plopping open the Bible and reading from a, uh, an American 21st century perspective um, in the English language, right? It, it, I mean, the, if the scripture is truly God's revelation of himself, then we need to take that a little more seriously <laughs> and and do our homework. And so just the understanding that you really do have to do some homework in order to properly understand scripture. You have to look at, you know, uh, the original context. You have to look at the original language and interpretations. And um, and you have to look at the, you know, the genre of skip, scripture and and also you have to look at it while you're looking at God's other book of revelation in creation. God has God is a is an honest, true, uh, you know, truth giving God, and He's not going to try to mislead His people through His revelation. So if if we truly believe that God is both the the giver of Scripture as well as the creator of this world and universe that we live in, then we need to take both of those books of Revelation uh, very seriously. And so we have to, like I say, do justice to our reading of the written word. And we also have to do justice to exploring his revelation of himself in, in the world um, and, and see how those two books fit together. And I think that is our job as believers in trying to tr really understand uh, God's full revelation of himself. Yeah, you know, I want you to dig deeply in, in, in just a few minutes into the two books of, of Revelation there. Um, but let's just just hang on to what you were talking about, the title of your book, The, the Big Bang. It wasn't the Big Bang Theory for many years rejected by those who had no faith at all or atheistic scientists? Did, am I getting that correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, in fact, the idea of the Big Bang Theory um, was put first put forth by a priest, um, Lemaitre, and um, and it was it was kind of made fun of by many of the kind of naturalistic scientists. Um, I think Fred Hoyle was one that that made fun of it. And, you know, uh you know, they, they joked about, you know, oh, you know, people are going to run off to join the first church of Christ of the Big Bang, you know, and and um, as time went on, um, you know, it, you know, and at first, like I say, this whole this whole idea of a Big Bang um, was kind of scoffed at. But as time went on and more and more evidence accumulated, um, scientists were certainly forced to come to terms with it. Um, but but one of the problems that atheistic scientists had with it was uh, the fact that the Big Bang theory basically points to a beginning of the universe. Mm. In other words, the universe has not always existed. And the, the theory that was commonly um, accepted prior to that was the steady state theory, which basically kind of reflects Carl Sagan's famous statement of the universe is all that ever was, all that is, and all that ever will be. And the idea 
was that this universe had always existed. Therefore, there was no need to explain a beginning. So if we go back to kind of the cosmological argument, which is one of the classical arguments for God, um, it basically says that anything that begins to exist must have a cause uh, for its existence. So this is this. This is also this is an argument that's based in logic. Okay, so the idea mm -hmm. is that if something is not eternal, then you then there had to be some sort of a cause for it to come into existence. So this is this is the problem. This, this is the crux of the issue that atheistic scientists had with the Big Bang idea, was it went from this you know neat and tidy theory of the steady state. Uh, universe that it always had existed. Therefore, if it was in eternal, there was no need to explain a beginning to a universe that had not always existed. Therefore, it begged the question, what caused it? Where did it come from? And so, so you can see how the idea that the universe had a beginning comports much better with Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth than a steady state model of the universe, which said that it always existed and didn't need a, a creation motion, moment. Leslie, what are the 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 uh, the Hubble the Hubble which you've worked on, and we'll get into that in just a, a minute yeah, or behind the scenes, um, and also the James Webb Telescope. What are they telling us about um, a creator, in your opinion? Wow, that is a huge topic. Um, it's kind of like, okay, what what is all of the astronomical and astrophysical evidence <laughs> that we have to date say about a created universe, which is a fair question, okay? Um, um, I think that this is the beautiful thing to me, is that the more we explore God's creation, the more we see this compatibility between science and faith. So if we look at just the simple evidence for an expanding universe, which really is what supported the Big Bang Theory so greatly. So the idea that um, the universe was, was created um, and that at one time it was a, a singularity, a single point basically with all the matter and energy and that compacted into one small um, point in space space time and then that it expanded rapidly from that and continues to expand to this day so um the hubble space telescope uh, as well as other telescopes have been uh, instrumental in detecting the continuing expansion of the universe so we see um red shifts uh doppler red shifts in distance distant galaxies from the type of light that we would expect to see from those galaxies, it's shifted towards the red end of the spectrum, which is the longer wavelength end of the spectrum. So just as when you observe a siren on a police car or an ambulance going by you, when that's coming toward you, you hear a higher pitch because the sound waves are uh, bunched together. And so you hear a higher pitch when it's coming towards you. You see a, hear a lower pitch as it goes away because the sound waves are stretched apart. So the same thing with starlight. Um, if, some, if a starlight or a source of light is receding from us, then we're going to um, see those light waves coming from it stretched out into longer wavelengths, which correspond to the reddish end of the, the spectrum. And so we see this every direction we look in space. We see galaxies whose light is red shifted from what we would expect to see. And so that provides evidence that the universe is expanding uh, basically in every, every direction. And, um, and not only that, but the galaxies that are farthest away from us are moving away faster. Okay, and so we we see this kind of accelerating expansion of the universe, and so then that actually um, led to this idea of dark energy, 
and that, well, why is this expansion of the universe going faster and faster? Why is it accelerating? Because when we think of a typical, typical explosion, um, it loses energy over time. As something explodes, it eventually loses energy and kind of peters out, so to speak. But in, in this case, uh, the expansion that started with the, the Big Bang uh, is accelerating. And so scientists came up with this idea of dark energy that is kind of the energy that fuels this accelerating expansion of the universe. And both dark energy and dark matter are things that we don't have a real good grasp on yet. But they're concepts that help us to kind of describe what we're seeing from the evidence that we're collecting. Um, wow, I could go on and on. There, um, I think, you know, another example of something that kind of um, shows how well science and faith um, uh, are compatible uh, is in the area of, um, well, there's two, two that come to mind. One is in string theory, okay? So string theory basically says that uh, the math that describes the expansion of the universe um, works out better if you have uh, somewhere around 10 physical dimensions of space uh, and one dimension of time instead of the three dimensions of physical space that we experience on a regular basis. Um, but now um, we're, we're realizing that, or it's being speculated, I should say. It's, it, we don't really have the evidence for it, but we're speculating that perhaps there are multiple dimensions of time as well as these extra dimensions of space. Wow. So just from a kind of very, very simplistic standpoint, if you think about the linear timeline that we experience going just one direction, okay, so that's represented by a one-dimensional line. Okay, if we can add just one more dimension to that and make it a plane instead of just one line, then you can imagine that within that plane, an entity could be everywhere at once mm. along a timeline. And, and isn't that the description of God being omnipresent? You know, so so right there to me, it's like, wow, that's so cool. You know, even string theory there's and and never mind even these extra dimensions of physical space that allow things that would seem to be contradictory or uh, completely incompatible in the three dimensions of physical space that we actually experience become um, just, you know, uh, easy to explain if you've got extra dimensions of physical space in terms of just movements, you know, uh, you know, Christ going through the wall to appear to the disciples comes to mind, you know, and, and, and then on another topic at the cutting edge of science, we have quantum mechanics and quantum mechanics was really revolutionary in the, the, our scientific understanding. Okay. So, Prior to um, evidence uh, that ac accumulated uh, for quantum mechanics, we had a very deterministic view of the universe and the, the physical world. Um, and it was very Newtonian um, in, the, in the sense that every physical uh, cause has a series of effects that play out kind of like a domino, okay? Domino, a ser series of dominoes. One thing causes the next, et cetera. And that things could be traced back to the original cause uh, very clearly and that things were so incredibly uh, consistent that you could predict things really easily. Now, quantum mechanics kind of turned that idea on its head. So in, in quantum mechanics, we, we basically um, are looking at probabilities and we're looking at probabilities of particles, for example, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle talks about the fact that it's impossible to know both the position and the velocity of a particle at the same time. We're typically talking here about um, uh, subatomic particles uh, because in order to detect a subatomic particle, you have to get it to move so it, it releases uh, a photon of light. So um, you can only detect its position by the, the light that it emits. 
And by the time that it, you detect the light, it has moved. <laughs> the particles move. So you can't, you can't know both of those things at once. Similarly, um, you can't know the exact decay rate of radioactive particles. It's all based on probabilities. So quantum mechanics basically took us from this very deterministic view of the universe to one that's more probabilistic. And, you know, some people, again, had trouble with that kind of transition um, from kind of being able to predict things very nicely to say, no, you know, it's really more about probabilities. And so... To me, though, the, the kind of cool thing about that is that um, this, this um, lack of certainty uh, the, in the probabilistic nature um, of things happening at a subatomic le level um, say, you know, well, we can say that the, you know, Newton's law of gravity is 99.999, you know, uh, percent likely to act according to the equation that we describe it with, um, you know, uh, but, but it, there's always, there's that, it's not a hundred percent. It's like, there's this lack of certainty and it's an acknowledgement that we don't have things as kind of cut and dried and quantified as we'd like perhaps. But the, the flip side of that is that in saying that the laws of physics are, um, in most cases, have a very, very high probability of acting thus and so, it's not 100% certain that that will always be the case. And so, it to me, it opens up the space for the miraculous. <clears throat> and, you know, and I had for a long time before I kind of came to that realization had kind of worried over, it's like, well, why, why would God go to such an extreme care to set these laws of physics up exactly as they are in order yeah. to create the universe that we have that is life friendly. And that in itself is so improbable from a naturalistic standpoint. But my, my problem was, was like, why would he take such care to do that, to create all this orderliness and then break those laws of physics in doing the miraculous? So mm. this, this idea of quantum mechanics, the uncertainty that it implies, opens up this space for the miraculous without the creator. Well, I should say together with this extra dimensionality opens up this space for, for God to do the miraculous without violating the laws that he set in place at the beginning. So I don't know. I, like I said, for me, the excitement comes in realizing at the cutting edges of science, the things that we're just beginning to understand, we see even more compatibility with faith. And Leslie, you, you talk about the cutting edge of, of, sci of the sciences and, you know, what you've just stated, really, it blows my mind. Because it looks like the the more that you look into the sciences um, and you have a humble heart, uh, you'll see a creator there. And, and my question to you is, where do we get the idea that science is opposed to faith? What, what do you think? Well, you know, that's, that's kind of a, an age old question, I guess. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, I mean, really, modern science and the, the scientific revolution arose out of uh, Christian scientists like Newton and Copernicus, Galileo, you know, all of the, the scientists that were involved in the scientific revolution um, were self-professing Christians. And it actually was because of their faith that they wanted to explore God's creation. They were motivated by their faith to understand the creator and, and also, I mean, if you look at it's, it's, I don't think there's, it's any coincidence that uh, modern science came out of Christianized Western Europe because of this view that God reveals himself through his creation. So it really was like an act of worship to uh, think God's thoughts after him, right? Um, and to explore his creation. And, and you know, the, these guys were often um, 
both students of science as well as theology. And they were trying to, you know, learn more about God's creation really uh, in an effort to understand, you know, what, what God had created and how, I mean, really it, it reveals more and more of God's glory when you understand these incredible uh, intricacies and synergies that we see between various parts of creation. Um, so the idea I think of, well, I think there, again, it kind of goes back to this spectrum that I referred to before is, is, you know, you've got people on one end of the spectrum who are very concerned that uh, anything other than an extremely literal 21st century English based interpretation of scripture is, is uh, somehow sacrilegious. Um, and then people on the other end of the, spe the spectrum that for whatever reason or another want to take God out of the picture altogether. And, you know, I mean, that, that can be a whole lot of reasons, um, maybe many of which point back to some deep hurt or, you know, um, uh, lack of resolution to the problem of evil. You know, um, I think you, you hear that a lot, you know, it's like, how could a good God allow so much evil in the world? And, you know, for me, it comes down to, to free will. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think that's a real stumbling block for a lot of people. And, and so again, when it's an emotional commitment, it's very hard to kind of move people, uh, away from those positions. I, I find that, you know, in teaching, um, just, kind of coming, coming to the topic in a very gentle way and just saying, you know, look, first of all, it, scripture tells us that God has revealed the truth, his own truth, the truth about him through his creation. And so we shouldn't be afraid to study God's creation and to look seriously at what we learn about God's creation, because it does truly reveal the creator, you know, and, and so I think that's, that's one really good starting point. Um, uh, another is just, you know, kind of understanding that, you know, we should be uh, a high view, a high view of scripture really requires treating it um, in a serious fashion and not just opening it up like you would a comic book or, you know, a magazine or something like that, you know, that a really high view of scripture uh, requires that we, we take it seriously and we um, learn about the context. I mean, we wouldn't take any other ancient book and try to read it with a 21st century American understanding, you know, so why do we do that with scripture? I think, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. I think um, one of the things in our country's history that has compounded this problem is, uh, was the fundamentalist uh, movement in, in our country, um, where, you know, it was kind of in the wake of uh, the Reformation. And, um, you know, people... Uh, we're trying to really get away from the, the idea that the priests of the Catholic church were the only ones that were really qualified to, um, uh, expound on, on scripture. And, and so this kind of knee jerk reaction to that, I believe was in large part, um, the foundation of the fundamentalist movement, which kind of, you know, people were like, Oh, you know, just read your Bible and, you know, um, God will reveal to you what it means for you, you know, and, and I'm not saying there's not some truth in that, you know, but it's, it's more than that. It's more than just, like I say, you know, doing it from this very casual perspective. It's like, we really need to do our homework and understand that uh, reading and interpreting scripture is a high calling and we, we need to give it the serious, um, uh, work or, you know, background research that it needs. So I, I do think this kind of fundamentalist movement and the idea that, oh, you know, you can read scripture for yourself and take away what you take away from it without really any, any training. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of this backlash, you know, and, and I think, um, it's kind of a shame that that came about rather than 
really promoting this this uh, idea that you know take it seriously you know if you want to read and interpret scripture for yourself then do the homework that you need to in order to do that properly yeah and, and i think at, at many times within the church body we we separate over non-essential issues. Uh, it was, we certainly should agree on the essentials of the core doctrines yeah. of the Christian faith, but sometimes we we fight amongst one another and call each other heretics for things that ha- have nothing to do with the core essentials exactly. of, of, of the Christian faith. Exactly, exactly. In fact, um, uh, I, I'm currently in a position at Biola University, and our uh, university president, Barry Corey, wrote a, a book recently called Love Kindness. And mm. in it, he talks about the, the hard core of the Christian faith, the non-negotiables, um, you know, that, that Christ is the Savior, <laughs> um, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, you know, the, the essentials of the faith, the salvific uh, elements of the faith so the, the like I say, they're, they're the non-negotiables. If you're going to be a Christian, these are non-negotiables. And then he's, so he had the hard core, the hard center, and then the fuzzy edges, which are the areas where we need to extend grace to each other because, you know, there is not a divine revelation that tells us specifically the answer to all these more kind of, uh, thorny issues that that we can wrestle with that aren't salvific um they're they're not essential to the core of our faith but um i think that if we don't treat them seriously we uh we can uh leave stumbling blocks in the way of of people in this case in faith and science i think we can leave stumbling blocks in the way for uh people who are, are scientifically minded to come to faith, you know, um, if we don't have good answers for, for how science and faith come together, um, and for people of faith, uh, to consider, uh, the value of science, you know, I mean, I kind of grew up, uh, you know, in, in a little bit of that, um, just from the standpoint of not kind of having figured it out, by the time I was graduating from high school, you know, I was always good in math and science and was encouraged to go into math and science, but I hadn't figured out how they fit together um, in a robust way. And I took a lot of math and science as an undergrad, but I actually majored in political science because I just hadn't resolved it yet. And then came back into the, the STEM fields in grad school. So I was kind of doing it the hard way, but uh, I think, you know, if, if people had been able to remove some of those stumbling blocks for me, I, I might have, uh, you know, had a little bit easier time of it. Oh, well, Leslie, let's segue in, in, in from that into uh, your journey, uh, your journey into the, the scientific fields, uh, your how you you're considered what's called a, a and you probably get tired of hearing this, but you're a rocket scientist and and you're probably tired of hearing that. Uh, but but you are. And I don't think I've ever interviewed a rocket scientist before. But talk about your journey. How did you get into these fields? Um, how did you how did you come to a relationship with, with Christ as well? Okay, yeah. So um, my relationship with Christ uh, goes way back to my childhood. And, you know, as I mentioned before, my my family was very involved in church. And, you know, we went to church in Sunday school on a regular basis um, from the time I was born. And, um, and, you know, for as long as I can remember, I remember praying, you know, and thinking of Jesus as my best friend and and I do remember a specific time when I was seven years old in Sunday school when the uh, pastor came in and explained what it meant to be a Christian and what it meant to accept Jesus as your Savior, you know. And and I decided then that I wanted that. And so, um, you know, I uh, prayed the prayer. <laughs> and uh, and then a couple years later, and this is... This is uh, something that was very formative in my early life. So nine years old, I went to Bible camp and, um, I remember 
there were missionaries speaking at this Bible camp and um, talking about their work um, in Africa. And I went back to my cabin night after night, and I was so impressed that God was calling me to the mission field that I cried myself to sleep for about, I don't know, three nights in a row or so, because it just, I hear I am nine years old, you know, and the last thing I want to do at that point is, you know, leave my home and my family and go overseas and live in a grass hut and, you know, with a dirt floor, yeah. just all these images, you know, are in my little head. And, yeah. and, uh, for several nights in a row, like I say, I just cried myself to sleep because I was so distraught over this. And yet it was such a profound sense that God was calling me to do that. And, and after a few nights, I, I fully surrendered. I mean, I just said, okay, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And I just was overcome by this amazing sense of peace, you know, just, you know, I mean, I can remember it like it was yesterday, even though it was decades ago, you know, and, and, um, anyway, from that point on, I just resolved to look for God's direction at every turn in the road and, um, uh, flash forward, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think, uh, I guess after I got out of college, I had the opportunity to go on some short-term missions trips and kind of thought, you know, along the way that maybe God would call me to be a full-time missionary. Um, in, and specifically, I had an opportunity um, in the late 90s to go with Athletes in Action Volleyball to South Africa. And I really thought, you know, this might be it. Because in my mind as a kid, it was Africa, you know. And... Um, <clears throat> So I, uh, right before I got on the plane, uh, one of my friends said, oh, you've got to read this book by Paolo Coelho called The Alchemist. And so I picked it up and I read it on the plane on the way over there. And, you know, I don't know if you've read it, but it's the story of this. It's kind of, Paolo Coelho is a priest and he writes in kind of the allegorical style of a C.S. Lewis or someone like that. Mm -hmm. And anyway, it tells a story about this, um, shepherd boy in Spain who discovers a map to hidden treasure uh, on their farm in Spain and takes his, the, the map takes him to Africa, but he takes this very circuitous path and stops along the way and does different jobs and whatnot. And he gets to the spot in Africa and that the map leads him to, and he discovers another map that takes him back home to his farm in Spain. And that's where the real treasure is. And it was just such a, you know, allegory for my own life, yeah. you know, yeah. and I uh, got to, to Africa for this missions trip. And, um, it was, it was interesting because we were playing in these, uh, beach volleyball tournaments and the women that played, uh, in these tournaments in South Africa would get together and pray before the tournament started. And mm -hmm. it was just kind of like the light bulb went on. It's like, well, I can do that back at home, you know? <laughs> and so <clears throat> I got back home and actually really shortly after that experience, um, started playing with this women's professional football team. And yeah, you've, you've got to speak about that. I'm sorry to interrupt, but speak about that. that that's, uh, I, I was shocked when I heard that, but talk about that a little bit as well. Well, well, let me let me continue the thread real yeah, quick, and then yeah. we'll circle back. Sure. But, um, but I was uh, I was designated as the chaplain, uh, in addition to being a team captain and player on the team, um, and found myself, you know, praying at practices for the whole the whole team. We'd get together, we'd pray before practice, we'd pray before games. Uh, ladies were coming to me with their prayer requests and asking me to pray for them, and. It was just like, wow, this, is, I mean, it was just such a beautiful thing, you know, and, and over time, I've actually realized that my true mission field is this whole res reconciliation between science and faith. Um, mm. But anyway, so that, yeah, um, but backtracking to the football. Uh, <laughs> so let's see. Um, well, I've always been pretty sporty. I did um, volleyball, basketball, and track through, um through high school and into college. And, um, let's see, uh, 
Yeah. So like I said, I've always just been athletic and I, I've also had, I think a healthy dose of FOMO fear of missing out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so I've, I've always been this kind of like, Oh, I, I want to try that. I want to try that. And, and so, um, Let's see. Um, shortly before I joined this women's football team, um, I had been playing with playing flag football with a group of guys from my church. We'd get together on Sunday afternoons and 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 play flag football. <clears throat> and uh, one of the guys on the team uh, was online and somehow stumbled across this women's league that was forming. And and he's like, Leslie, you've got to go and try out for this, you know. Um, and so, um, cause some of the guys that were playing on this flag football team were pretty high level. I mean, they were actually playing men's semi pro. And so wow. anyway, so they, they're like, you should go try out. And so I went and tried out and then, and I, I played offense, defense. And, and I remember one season I, I started, I was a starting tight end, starting middle linebacker, and I started on every special team except for kickoff. <laughs> I, was, I was like, oh, I didn't know you could do that. But <laughs> anyway, it was just a blast. I absolutely loved it. And I played for about, I think, seven years and uh, just really enjoyed it. And, you know, it gave me an appreciation for football that I'd never had before because, you know, when you go out and play flag or backyard po- football it's typically okay everybody go out for a pass you know and yeah, yeah. and when it's it's actually an organized team you you know have very precise routes and you know I was a receiver so um you run your route and turn your head and there's there's the ball you know so it's kind of like chess on steroids <laughs> well you wanted you were on a championship team weren't you yeah, yeah, yeah. The first year I played, we won the Women's World Bowl, so that was pretty exciting. So, wow, well, yeah, an, an amazing, an amazing career, amazing journey, and and it seems like uh, you know your your passion um, is the, that reconciliation between science and faith, and it looks like it really looks like God is using you in those areas. Um, uh, you know, another thing that you talk about in in your book is uh, the Goldilocks principle. And and my question to you is, what, is, what does Goldilocks have to do with science? <laughs> the cosmo, the, uh, the solar system, if you will, the cosmos. Okay, okay. Yeah, so, um, yeah, the Goldilocks principle is kind of a, a fun way to describe what is otherwise known as the anthropic principle or the fine-tuning argument or, you know, teleological argument. I mean, it goes by a lot of different names, but it's this this um, concept or this observation that the universe, not just, not just the earth, not just the solar system, not just our galaxy, but the entire universe has a very long list of uh, finely tuned parameters uh, that give rise to the possibility of life. And you tweak any one of those uh, either uh, to be greater than what it is or less than what it is, and the possibility of life evaporates. Um, So uh, these things are, are, as I mentioned before, kind of the fine-tuning of the physical laws. Um, You know, within our solar system, it's kind of fun to to think about uh, some of the, the things that apply within our solar system. Like, for example... Um, well, in fact, it's kind of interesting because uh, in the astronomy or astrophysics community, um, it's the the proper distance of a planet from its star is now known as the Goldilocks zone. Okay, so the proper distance to give it uh, give that planet the right temperature to have water exist in all three physical forms, solid, liquid, and gas, um, is, is known as the Goldilocks zone. And it's essential for life. You, you have to have a, a planet uh, on which water can exist in all three physical forms in order to support life of, of any complexity. Um, and so 
So, so that's basically what the Goldilocks um, principle is. It's not just that one uh, factor of how far the uh, planet is from its star that gives rise to the proper temperature, but it's a whole bunch of other things too. So uh, for example, uh, the, the size of the planet has to be exactly right. It has to be really close to what Earth's, Earth's uh, size is because the mass of a planet gives rise to how much gravity it, it has. And um, the amount of gravity that a planet has dictates the kinds of gases um, that it can keep in its atmosphere. So for example, um, in in Earth's case, again, like I say, you know, a planet has to be pretty pretty darn close to exactly the size of Earth because Earth's gravity is strong enough to hold on to uh, water vapor or water in its gaseous form, okay? And uh, yet not quite strong enough to hold on to the poisonous gases of methane and ammonia in large amounts. Uh -huh. so, so think about this. So the water vapor molecule, H2O, you remember from your high school chemistry class, um, <laughs> The, Barely. the molecular yes. weight, maybe you do, <laughs> uh, the molecular weight of, uh, of water is 18 grams per mole, okay? Uh, but methane and ammonia are just slightly lighter at 16 and 17 grams per mole, and Earth's gravity is not strong enough to hold on to large amounts of methane and ammonia, but is strong enough to hold on to life-giving water vapor. So, I mean, that in itself is kind of mind-boggling. You know, the fact that it, Earth's gravity is tuned on a knife's edge. You know, if it's a little bit stronger, you hold on to these poisonous, poisonous gases in too large of amounts. If it's a little bit weaker, you don't hold on to life-giving water vapor. So the, and the, the list goes on and on. Those are just some of the really interesting ones. I mean, yeah, we could we could talk about a lot of different ones, but um, those are a couple of really great ones. Well, in in your book, you go into more detail as well. But it it seems like we are pretty special. That God created just just from the outset. It seems like God created this universe and went through all of these complex processes just to enable human beings to live on this earth. So. Um, yeah. that makes that it just in my, my uh, uneducated mind, I, I see the, the, uh, the creativeness, the, the handiwork of God, in essence, the fingerprints of, of a creator there that he's, he, yeah. he sees us as being special, uh, in yeah. his plan. Yeah. I mean, it, it just seems like a no brainer once you start to look at all these things. And then when you look at the entire list and how incredibly improbable it is to get all of these parameters just exactly right. I mean, it, it kind of begs the question, does it take more faith to believe yeah. that all of this was created by random chance or to believe that there's a creative intelligence behind it all? And to me, it's like a no brainer in terms of the answer. Um, the other thing, too, that I, I kind of like is, um, you know, the more that you look at all these finely tuned parameters that give us just exactly the right conditions for life, um, you, you look at, um, you know, uh, Romans one twenty, I think it is, that says uh, the truth about God can be seen in his creation. And, you know, a lot of people would just kind of shrug it off a little bit and say, well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you that you can see God's might and his power in his creation and what he's created. But to me, I, I'd say it goes a lot further than that because God has created the conditions for life that are enough for us not to just struggle to survive and eke out an existence, but that we can flourish and thrive and think about more important things than just our basic survival. We can have these conversations, you know what I mean? And, and so to me, the conditions that he allowed us to uh, live in, uh, like I say, and flourish and thrive in, speak to a God of love. So it gets past just that, oh, God is great and mighty and awesome, and he was powerful enough to create all this. But to me, it speaks to a God of love as well. We're not just some biology experiment. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and because of time, I, I, I kind of want to conclude uh, with this, uh, Leslie. Uh, you participate in, in endeavors to encourage women in the important fields of science and religion. Talk to me a little bit about what you do there. Yeah, so I was blessed to receive this um, grant from the John Templeton Foundation, um, specifically designed to encourage women to participate in this this important field of science and religion or science and faith and to uh, elevate women's voices, to um, uh, mentor them, to provide community and networking and collaboration opportunities. Um, because as in many fields, uh, you know, this field tends to be more male dominated and women coming to the conversation table and having these converse conversations, um, there are different topics that um, can be explored or that are desired to be explored by women. Um, and women bring different attributes to the conversation. Um, uh, you know, women tend to be um, compassionate and nurturing. And um, they actually, there's been some uh, research done that in, in many cases, women can actually think cross-disciplinarily <laughs> uh, mm. better than men can. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, many I mean, boxes, right? Yes, exactly. You yeah, know, multitasking yeah. and thinking kind of across right and left brain. Um, and um, that they're actually really good at, at understanding the, the nuances of these conversations that we're having. So, so anyway, I'm, I'm, I feel really blessed and privileged to uh, be leading this, this project. Um, uh, if, if you're a woman out there that is interested in the field of science and faith or science and religion, um, please check out our, out our website. It's wishprogram.org. And there are different ways that you can get involved with, whether um, you, you'd like to participate in a focus group to talk about some of these questions or issues that uh, women face. Um, or we have a survey that we'd love to get your uh, input into, and you can also see about uh, upcoming events. Well, and, and, and it seems like um, we certainly need uh, more young folks, uh, certainly women in these fields as well, but also uh, younger men as well, it, it specifically of faith. Uh, because again, we've got this idea that science is opposed to faith, and it's 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 completely the opposite. So we, we certainly need more. We need more uh, believers in these fields, in the sciences, in the arts, um, what have you, and in these in these leading fields. We need more believers in that who are grounded in their faith, but at the same time they're at the top of their field in these sciences, for example. So yeah, yeah wish wishprogram dot org. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that. I'll yeah, put all I mean, of these links below. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. You know, and and I believe personally that people of faith should make the best scientists because we know the Creator. So we 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 are getting to know at least you know the mind of God and and can kind of expect that God would provide for his creatures in his creation. And I think it gives us some insights um, that we can use in our science. If we, we know the creator behind the creation, then mm. we should have some, some greater insights and intuitions about the way he creates. So I think it's, I think it's just a perfect match uh, in terms of pairing those fields. And I think you mentioned in one of your speeches, Proverbs 25, two as well, Leslie, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. Does that yes, tie in? Yes. yes, absolutely. Just this, it's almost this, it's the way God has set it up. He uses the mystery of his creation to draw us into relationship with him. And as we explore, again, for me, my experience has been the deeper I dig into these mysteries of creation, the more I stand in awe of the creator behind it all. It's just like, oh my gosh, that is just mind blowing the way he put these things together. And again, kind of getting back to the, the multidimensionality, you know, in, in our kind of three-dimensional view of the world, yeah. um, 
we don't understand how things fit together. But when you kind of have this inkling that God is not constrained by these dimensions of space and time, it gives you it, it kind of where it enables us to take God outside of the box that we've put him in this box of our own understanding and go, no, you are way beyond that. And I'm going to take you out of that box that I've constructed and let you be God. You know, so it's just, I mean, like I said, it's just, it's just magnified my, my view of who God is. And, and Leslie, uh, there's so much, so many more questions I'd, I'd want to ask you and, 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 and pick your brain on, but unfortunately we don't have time for that. But Leslie, what type of legacy? I'm just curious. Do you want to leave with, you know, your, your gifting is in the sciences, um, and you're working as it, at it as unto the Lord, obviously. What type of legacy do you want to leave? You know, I, I think that's, that's a great question. I think what I would be most pleased to leave is, is an example of a life surrendered, of, of somebody who acknowledges that the life that I've led in following God and looking for the opportunities that he brings along has just made my experience so much richer than if I had tried to take control and, you know, d uh, direct my life according to my own decisions. Um, I think, like I said, I just, I just would encourage people to surrender and trust God for a more exciting life than you could ever imagine. It's pretty good advice. Leslie, what, what are you doing? What is keeping you busy these days? Are you working on any, any new projects, books, lectures? What's going on with well, you? I would, I would love to, um, uh, uh, you know, write another book before too long that would be more kind of a devotional kind of thing, reflecting on these different aspects of nature that are just so carefully uh, put together and thought out by our creator, our loving creator. Um, uh, but that's kind of on the back burner. I don't really have time for that right now. This uh, WISH program is taking up a lot of my time. Um, but I'm also doing a lot of uh, speaking engagements, whether it's uh, podcasts or um, lectures at churches or uh, things of that nature. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm keeping real busy. I'm, I'm working with students on campus on some different uh, club activities. Um, uh, we, we're trying to get an astronomy club going, and then we've got another club that we've just created called STEM with a mission, mm -hmm. STEM standing for science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine, and, um, trying to give students a view to how they can connect their, uh, discipline, uh, toward missions work, whether that's home or abroad. And just the idea of, you know, being able to give a cup of clean water uh, to a person who doesn't necessarily have it or, you know, using technology in some way to improve the standard of living for uh, others that are less fortunate than we are. Well, those are amazing projects and God bless you for doing what you do. Uh, Leslie, I, I, I'll put all of the links below the video, but and I'll ask you to hang on maybe 30 seconds post-interview. Um, but thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for telling us about what you do and why you do it. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Tony.